So this morning, it is my true pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Mindy Brashears. She is the Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety in the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, Dr. Mindy Brashears uh, comes to the USDA from Texas Tech University, where she was a professor of food safety and public health uh, for many years, uh, working on a variety of topics mostly related to meat and poultry safety, into antimicrobial resistance uh, development and control and a variety of other um, research projects. Dr. Brashears has an extensive career performing uh, and conducting international food safety research in Mexico, in Central America, in the Caribbean, in South America, uh, where she has helped uh, multiple um, meat and poultry companies um, develop HACCP plans and sanitation plans um, and basically uh, training a number of people, um, both domestically and abroad. Uh, she is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and has received multiple awards from the International Association for Food Protection and for the American, from the American Meat Science Association, uh, where she has received the Distinguished, Distinguished Industry Service and Distinguished Research Award um, in, in, in the last five years. Uh, as I mentioned, she has an extensive publication record in peer-reviewed journals and has been invited to speak at national and international events on uh, food safety topics. Um, she has more than 20 patents or patent pendants for her innovative approach to improving food safety in the food supply. Dr. Brashears has been nominated to be the USDA Undersecretary for Food Safety. Under her leadership, the Food Safety and Inspection Service of the United States Department of Agriculture will continue its mission uh, of protecting public health, uh, public health through the implementation of its three strategic uh, goals. Number one, prevent foodborne illness and protect public health, modernize inspection systems and policies, and three, the use of scientific approaches to achieve and to achieve operational excellence. Uh, Dr. Bashir started her academic, her professional career here at Nebraska uh, in 1997, I think, to 2001. Um, I happen to have the position that she had 20 years ago. Uh, there's still, uh, there are things in my lab that still say Brashears, right? My students have seen those, those things in my lab. Uh, Dr. Brashears also happened to be my boss for five and a half uh, years because she was my PhD advisor and my postdoctoral um, research supervisor. So uh, with that, uh, Dr. Mindy Brashears. <laughs> Thank you. Can y'all hear me? Is this, let me move it up a bit. Thank you so much, Byron, Dr. Chavez. It's definitely an honor to be back here at the University of Nebraska. It's very humbling and overwhelming, and I'm so excited to be here to speak to you today. Uh, There's so many stories, and you will get to hear some of them today, but so many of them uh, start out with when I was at the University of Nebraska. So I'm going to tell them, I'll try to uh, compose myself and, and not get emotional, but you know, this place means a lot to me, and I'm so happy to be here and to, to be here with uh, all of you today to speak about FSIS. I have spent my career as a scientist, and I'll talk to you about that a, uh, a little bit as we go along, but I am very happy to talk to you how we are merging, how science really informs our decisions in food safety uh, and for FSIS, and I want to talk about some of our current programs that we are involved with. So. Just to give you a little bit of an overview of what I will be talking about, I'm going to give you some information on my background in education. Then I'm going to talk about some of our modernized inspection initiatives, our performance standards, our micro testing, and uh, how we are analyzing some of our new products, our consumer education programs, and then some of our emphasis on recruitment. These are the, the areas where I'm learning uh, about the agency and where I've seen really science take an important role. It's uh, been a, a very steep learning curve. Every day I go in my office and I, there's just more information, more data. And it's been kind of fun as a scientist to be able to get more information, be exposed to new people, new scientists. And as uh, researchers, I think you can all appreciate that. 
So my background, uh, before we jump into that, I just uh, jump into details. I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Texas and I got my uh, bachelor's degree at Texas Tech University. And then I went on to Texas Tech for my bachelor's degree in uh, food science, went to Oklahoma State University where I got both, both my master's and my PhD and then started my career here at the University of Nebraska, was here almost five years, and then I moved back to Texas Tech. I thought I was going to be there for the rest of my life. There was never uh, any dream to go to DC, and, and there are still days I wake up and I think, is this really happening? Do I live here? Um, I'll ask my husband, I'm like, does this seem real yet? And he's like, no, it's still, you know, it's, 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 but it's really great. We're loving every minute of it. So a little more details. I, uh, you know, you think about decisions you make and you know, I, you're here as students, so I'm gonna give you a little more detail. Uh, decisions you make and you think, you know, it's just a random decision and, and you know, where's it gonna, where are you gonna end up? Well, I remember all the way back into high school and I was enrolling for my high school classes and my mom was a teacher. We were at a very small high school and she came in and she had our ag teacher with her and he was a neighbor from down the road. We grew up on the farm, so we didn't have any close neighbors. And he was like, hey, would you like to take ag? And at the time, all the girls took home ec and all the boys took ag. And then I was like, sure, I'll go be in ag class. That's where all the boys are. But no, that's not really what it is. I, uh, I, I went into ag and I, I recruited a few of my friends to go with me. And so we ended up being some of the first girls to take ag in high school. And that led me, you know, I was always involved in showing animals and, and, and in FFA activities, and that led me to have a degree, uh, scholarship from the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. And I w went to Texas Tech, and I was going to be a pre-med major. I was set on becoming a medical doctor. And I look back and think that's the best decision I'd never made. But I had to be just, you know, the lifestyle is pretty tough. But, but now it's pretty tough as well. But anyway, that's another story. I... Um, I went, ended up in the Department of Animal Science at Texas Tech because I had to major in ag to get this scholarship. And I thought, I will be here for, you know, a couple of semesters, a couple of years, and then I'll switch into a real major. Well, up until about two months ago, I was still in that department. And uh, it was the best decision I ever made. But and it all really goes back to me deciding to go into FFA. So there's these decisions we make in our lives, and we don't realize how they're going to uh, lead us to different places. And so I'm going to fast forward to my first job uh, after I finished my PhD. And whenever I came out of uh, grad school, I had options to go to Purdue, Wisconsin, and the University of Nebraska. Steve Taylor was the department chair at the time, and I remember sitting down talking to him, and you know, we, he, he was able to talk me into coming to Nebraska. And, I, and it was such a great decision that has such an impact on my career. This was a great place to start. First day on the job, I'll never forget, was August 13th, 1997. And the reason I remember it so distinctly is the day of the Hudson ground beef recall, which at the time was the largest ground beef recall in history. They recalled 25 million pounds, well, of ground beef because E. coli contamination. Uh, Hudson Foods was in Columbus, Nebraska, and I was hired as the extension research and extension person. So I was supposed to work with the media and the industry. Day one, I didn't even have a phone in my office. I sat down in the main office of the uh, food, food science uh, department. I was answering these phone calls and I went, remember I went right into Steve Taylor's office. I said, are there any rules? Am I supposed to you know, say something or what am I not supposed to say? And he said, um, welcome to the world of academic freedom. If something goes wrong, you just make yourself look bad. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> that is, a, you probably don't remember that, but that's what you said. <laughs> So, gave me a lot of confidence though. But the next day I went and I grabbed the Omaha World, you know, I was quoted on there, very simple things, you know, how to cook your burgers and handle your food. And so that was a very interesting start to my career. Well, also at the time, uh, the governor was Ben Nelson and he allocated uh, funding for E. coli research. And you talk about being in a really good position in your career as a young junior faculty member and I worked with Anzi Benson and Rob Hudkins, and we, 
worked on E. coli research and there was money from the state and it really put my career on a path of very applied food safety research. So I was working with companies and it was, it was a, great, you know, a great way to start my career. Also at that time, it was in 97, and in 1998, it was when the new HACCP regulations came into place. So we moved from really, uh, there had been very few changes in the uh, Meat Inspection Act, and we were moving into a system of what they called command and control to a HACCP-based food safety approach of inspection. So I spent uh, many hours driving around the state with Dennis Burson teaching HACCP and just helping people get up to speed on what HACCP was and we had these, I mean we did dozens and dozens of HACCP workshops and going into these plants and trying to explain to them why it was so important to have HACCP in place. So I got to watch the changes. They went from people thinking it was a scary uh, system that you could never do anything with and they were never going to be able to meet those requirements to watching a change in attitude and behavior to seeing them implement actually the changes. And so it was a wonderful time to get to experience that firsthand. I can look back now and see how that, you know, really had such an effect to prepare me for the career where I am at today. I went to Texas Tech, uh, went back really home to, to my, where my family was, but they were super supportive of my work and I continued my work with really small and very small processors. That's kind of my, been my foundational work since I started. I did some work with larger industry partners as well, but most of the work I did was in HACCP validation, conducting validation studies and training. And I continued that all the way through, through Texas Tech with my work there. And then also I expanded out internationally in helping different uh, companies prepare for e equivalency and export. So, you know, the background has been great and I'm so thankful for all the time I got to spend at Nebraska and the things I learned here to really help me to get to where I am today in the FSIS. So I will jump uh, more into what we are doing. We are you know, as most of you know, if you're in food science, you know that the first Meat Inspection Act uh, was Im implemented in 1906, and it was a result of a book, The Jungle, that was written by Upton Sinclair, and I mean, probably most of you have read this, or it's a requirement in some of your classes, and uh, that was great to get our inspection system started. Uh, there's still a lot of those rules that are still in place, but we've moved beyond that. We're really a science-based agency. I have been uh, just really overwhelmed with the number of scientists within the FSIS. I knew we had inspectors. I knew we had, uh, you know, labs, but I never comprehended the expertise that we had within FSIS and the amount of science and data that we collect on a daily basis that informs all the decisions. And so I've had a great time working with Carmen Rottenberg, who's the FSIS administrator, Paul Kicker, who's our, admin, our assistant administrator, and I, we have made a great team. Uh, they are, Paul is really focused on the field or his expertise. Carmen is a lawyer and on policy. And I've got to come in there as a scientist and we've really made a great team working together to move uh, our policies forward. And we all have the same goal of making sure our food supply is safe and coming up with uh, mechanisms to make it even safer. So we really um, use science and policy, uh, science to drive our policy and to make decisions within the agency. And like I said, I did not have uh, near enough of an appreciation of this. And I get to sit at the table you know, the first week, you know, I come in and I have all these scientists and all of our group leaders surrounding me. They're DVM PhDs. I mean, probably a dozen of them that I work with on a daily basis. We have epidemiologists, we have microbiologists. Everyone has a PhD. Most of them have a PhD, Masters of Public Health, all sorts of experience. They're all very quiet. They do their job. You don't really hear about them a lot or their names as far as in an academic sense when you would go out and present data. But I can assure you they are the smartest people I have been around and they are really a dream team when it comes to food safety and public health. I cannot speak highly enough of the people that I get to work with on a daily basis. This trickles into every part from our communication team to our inspection force. It's just been a great opportunity to get to meet these people and understand how great they are. 
So I will jump into some of our uh, systems. First of all, I'm going to talk about our modernization efforts. I mentioned earlier that in 1997, we moved into a more HACCP based approach. All of our uh, meat and poultry plants had to implement HACCP and go under some uh, different guidelines instead of the command and control approach. And so we are really focusing on modernization now to focus our the activities of our inspection force to uh, be more food safety oriented as opposed to looking for quality defects. The first area we um, have implemented on our modernization side are, is our poultry modernization. So this has been in place for um, a couple of years now. I want to emphasize that even though we're modernized, we still do 100% carcass-by-carcass carcass inspection, 100% inspection by the FSIS, by the agency, and we still have that in place. So uh, I want to assure you about that. And so this program has been in place for a few years, and it was all driven by science. So whenever we had HACCP, uh, the HACCP rules in place in 1997, we had 20 poultry plants and five pork plants that went into a pilot system that were different uh, types of inspection models. And we collected data in those plants over the 20 year period on food safety. Then that data went into different risk assessments. Uh, risk assessment goes well beyond my microbiological expertise, but uh, you can see, I think, do I have a pointer up here? Well, anyway, I'll just point. So. Um, Lots of data here went in to inform this, but the bottom line is the poultry modernization, as we have people coming in, we see that it will, it's estimated to prevent 3,550 illnesses due to salmonella each year. All very science-based, based on the data we have collected in these plants and compared back to the data that we have in our regular system. Not that our regular system, you know, we still have full inspection, but we really want to emphasize moving our inspection activities to uh, a more oversight of food safety. So another area that we, you probably, I'm just going to touch on this a little bit that goes with this is uh, a change in the line speed. So right now, uh, poultry line speeds are capped at 140 birds per minute. Now there is an option to come out of that and process more and there's been some uh, controversy with this and, and making sure that it's safe. But I want to assure you, in order for a plant to change their line speed, number one, they have to be under new poultry inspection. Number two, they can't have any regulatory action against them in the past uh, you know, six months or actually a year maybe. <coughs> can't remember exactly. It's a, they have to have a good history of, the, uh, of regulatory compliance. Sorry, I'm still learning the rules. And uh, <laughs> I'll get them all down. And they also, most important as far as data-driven decisions, they have to collect data to show that at the increased line speed that their process is just as safe, if not more safe, than when they're operating at a slower line speed. So it's not just a random decision. There's a lot of data that informs this to make sure that the process is safe. Now, if they don't continue to meet this, then they will, uh, their line speed waiver will be revoked. We, this happened just a few weeks ago. One of our plants did have their line speed waiver revoked. They can have it reinstated eventually. But if you don't continue to meet those requirements, then your, the line speed waivers are revoked and we have to go back to um, our system that uh, the slower line speeds to ensure food safety. Port modernization. This one is coming up. We are waiting on the final rule to be accepted or to be approved by our different entities within the agency. So we're looking for pork modernization. Just like with poultry, we went through a very deliberative process to get to pork modernization. I'm not going to go through all of these steps, but again, this isn't something that just came up overnight. There, was a lot of, there were a lot of years of data collection, and the data was not only on food safety, but it was also on the inspection activities. So on one side, we have our microbiological sampling data. On the other side, we have uh, our inspection procedure data. Uh, what, what's the inspector doing? What kind of defects are they detecting? And, and you know, different entities. I mean, this report is hundreds of pages of long. 
uh, pages long. And this goes into different stages of analysis. So we come up with estimates, how this might work, how we might change. Then they go into regression models, simulation models, and then we get the output of what this means to the industry. Is it going to improve food safety or is it going to have a detrimental effect on food safety? So there's a lot of thought, a lot of information that goes into informing these decisions for modernization with the ultimate goal to make sure our food is safe and the ultimate goal is to reduce illnesses and to protect public health. We are a public health agency and that is our ultimate goal is to reduce illnesses. So similar to the, uh, the, the poultry modernization, within our estimates, moving towards pork modernization, the number of illnesses will be reduced by 2,533 when we move to pork modernization. Those are annual number of illnesses. So uh, again, it's a deliberate thought process. It's something that we don't come to uh, just uh, lightly in order to get this information. And that's one reason why it's taken so long to get to this point. Next area, poor, uh, performance standards. We have a number of different kinds of testing that we do within the agency. And performance standards are uh, one type of testing. And these are really routine standards that we have in place. The first type is uh, salmonella. So salmonella performance standards, okay, I'm going to back up again and reference this 1997 uh, HACCP mo uh, modernization. So at that time there were some requirements for generic E. coli testing uh, and then we had a salmonella testing program and they would go in once a year and take a window of salmonella samples and what, what was happening is everything was negative. So um, whenever you're always having negative results, then as you, any of you who are scientists, you know that that's meaningless. So we stopped uh, enforcing those and decided we need to move to something different. And that's where we got to in our salmonella performance standards. So uh, poultry, uh, depending on the type, there's uh, whole carcass standards, there's turkey standards, there's uh, broiler standards, and there's parts standards. And what, what we did in the standards is we took the Healthy People 2020 goals and we said, all right, if a certain number of plants are at this uh, prevalence of salmonella and they change from category uh, two to one or from three to two, we will prevent this many illnesses and we'll, we'll, we will move from, uh, to, to a level to start meeting our Healthy People 2020 goals. We're now working on Healthy People 2030 goals. And so as we move through our performance standards, we want that to happen. Now currently, we have um, in our young chicken carcasses, 86% of our companies are in category one or two. So they're in our level upper categories with 66% in category one. So we can have confidence that most are meeting those. We're always trying to work with those category threes and twos to bring them up to the next level. On chicken parts, uh, we have 56%, 56.8 are in category one and 24.4 in category two. So more than 80% of our companies are in category one or two. Always still trying to improve, but we're working toward those goals and they are all put into different models. Again, this is beyond my expertise as a microbiologist, all the math and the modeling to show that uh, we are moving toward our Healthy People 2020 and 2030 goals. Again, very deliberate. We're working with multiple agencies across the government with the public health agencies to meet these goals in order to reduce the number of salmonella illnesses. So I wanted to pop this up there. This is a, um, a graphic we use to show that sometimes, um, even though you don't have any changes, that the regulatory oversight actually does help reduce the number of illnesses or the salmonella prevalence. This isn't correlated to illnesses, it's correlated to the actual salmonella. So this is how we have started using our performance standards. So um, the secretary is very supportive of transparency, Secretary Purdue, and he wants uh, most of our data to be public and put out on the website. So uh, we're kind of moving toward that in a more positive direction. So 
back in 2005, 2006, we said, hey, we're going to start publicly uh, posting the names of establishments and what category you are in. And instantly, well, no, not instantly, but over time, this really dropped. Then in 2008, we started posting those, and over time, they, they dropped. Now, at this time, we did not have the same performance standards that we have in place. These were just, um, this was just basic data and information about the prevalence of salmonella. So here, we st uh, revised our performance standards and started putting people in categories. So beforehand, we just said we were publishing the data. Then we started putting them categories and we're seeing a drop as well. So it just shows that there's a level of accountability and an, a drop in, in our category threes as we start making that publicly available. Now, all of our data that we have is always available through FOIA request, but this is actually on the website all the time when you go there, so and believe me, FOIA is, uh, we get FOIA requests all the time, every single day, <laughs> and um, which is good. It's public information where government agency people have the right to have that information. So another uh, area where we use actually not just science, but scientists. And I'm so excited for when we get to have our first meeting, we're going through some procedures to get our new committee approved uh, at the highest levels. But we have the National Advisory Committee for the Microbiological Criteria for Foods. Many of you have probably heard of that. Of that. Some of you have probably served on it. And this is a group of scientists that uh, help us make informed decisions. And so we put forth, uh, both the FDA and USDA put forth questions to our National Science Advisory Committee, which uh, works as a, a government entity, and it's approved by the Secretary of Ag works with us to help make decisions. So uh, our industry groups may bring questions to us, our uh, consumer groups, our stakeholders, and then we say, okay, we need an outside third party to help us make decisions on a particular topic. We put it forward to our National Advisory Committee and they come up with those uh, answers for us. We'll get a really great peer review document and you know one of them uh, that they just published on salmonella and uh, salmonella in poultry will has just accepted to the Journal of Food Protection. So lots of science goes into this. So not only do we have the data that we have, we have our scientists. I want to go back to performance standards. Something I forgot to mention is the fact that all of the, the risk assessments and all of the data we have, that all goes out for peer review. So not only is it internal, it is also peer reviewed by other outside experts to make sure that it is accurate and that what we have is, is a legitimate and making good decisions. And there's oftentimes a peer review will come back and they're like, you need more data or you know, your confidence intervals are too large or whatever it may be and we collect more data. And I'll, show, I'll get to that here in a moment when we get to our pork testing. So, um, one of the questions, like I said, we put forth to the National Advisory Committee was should we declare uh, salmonella as an adulterant or are there particular factors, virulence factors in salmonella that makes one type of salmonella more virulent than others or maybe we should just look at antibiotic resistant salmonella. They took this question and, you know, just like any good group of scientists, came up with this great report. Well, so we have E. coli 0157H7 and other six other O groups as adulterants, but we have very specific factors. We have STX, EAE genes, we know what to look for, so it's not just anything that has E. coli in it is adulterated. With Salmonella, that group did a thorough re review of literature, and there's no particular group of genes which Andy can talk more about this than I can, but that, uh, that tells us that, yes, if you find these genes, it should be more virulent, or there's nothing right now, there's no criteria now that we can measure in salmonella. They also came back and made a conclusion on antibiotic-resistant salmonella and said that, you know, well, first and foremost, not all outbreaks are caused by antibiotic-resistant salmonella. It's not more, uh, it's, it's just as susceptible to cooking. It's just as likely to be there. So they also did not think that antibiotic-resistant salmonella should be an, uh, declared adulterants. What they did say is that we need to go to a risk-based approach for salmonella. Right now, we are just yes or no for performance standards, there or not. But salmonella definitely has a dose response. 
most of the time. My, uh, my advisor, Dr. Stan Gilliland at uh, Oklahoma State, always said, but bacteria don't read the book. So you always have the exception, and I always say bacteria don't behave. So sometimes you'll have you know, just a few cells of salmonella causing illnesses. But for the most part, it is a dose response. So as um, we're looking at rapid semi-quantitative methods, so maybe we can start moving toward a more risk-based assessment. So if we have a certain load or quantitative amount of bacteria, then we can uh, make better decisions about our product that's contaminated. But it needs to be a rapid method. When we're working with meat and poultry products, the shelf life is short, and so we need something that's quick but we need something that's AOAC approved, something that goes through the entire process. So again, using science. We are moving toward uh, beef performance standards, uh, just like with poultry. All the years of our beef testing, we would look at carcasses for salmonella, zero, zero, zero. So when you're always getting zero, again, you don't, uh, you, we stopped assessing for that. So we went to ground product and, uh, and uh, beef manufactured trimmings and all the samples we were getting for E. coli testing, we started looking for salmonella, developed a new baseline, and before the end of the year, we will be putting out new beef performance standards. This all goes through a process. So this will go out in the federal register, then our stakeholders will have a certain amount of time to comment. All of those comments are read. I was really shocked about that. They are read. We have people who read them, categorize them, and respond to all of those. So that'll go out for comment. Then we'll have a final rule that goes through the whole legal process before it is finalized. All right, so we had our performance standards, and then we have micro testing. Uh, uh, other, so we had our performance testing, and then we have other micro testing. And this would include things like our E. coli testing for beef. So uh, for a long time, we have only tested for 0157H7, except in beef manufactured trimmings, we have tested for all seven O groups. Now we did this originally when the rule was passed about eight years ago, or when the rule was expanded. We, uh, it was really expensive to test for all, of the, all, all seven, and so we just did it in the beef trimmings. But we're about to expand to uh, ground beef and other uh, beef uh, ground beef components such as uh, cheek meat, heart, uh, weasand, other things that can go into ground beef. We're expanding that because now the technology has evolved to the point where uh, our testing is not uh, as expensive and, and, and actually most of our tests already look for all of the different O groups and we almost have to kind of hide it so we want to expand that to all parts. Again this will come out in uh, before the end of the year, we, expand, we expect to have that. The reason that we expect that, or the reason we're expanding it, it, well, number one is because it's now economically available, but also some of our state public health agencies were looking for all 70 groups. They caught three of our outbreaks. We've had, well, we have 16, and I've, this needs to be updated as of Friday, 16 class, one recall, well, 16 class 1 recalls. We still don't have a recall, but we are in the middle of an outbreak with E. coli 103. Uh, still don't have a recall associated with that. The CD, we work closely with the CDC. We're working with them on the investigation to try to find a source. It's associated with ground beef. Uh, really, and, and it, it, it keeps growing slightly. Hopefully, we will get that under control uh, very quickly, and so we can hopefully find the source. But again, those are the people that we have working for us doing this investigation. So we've had enough of the outbreaks associated with the other O groups, not just 0157H7, so we're expanding it to the other STECs. Pork testing. This is, whoops. This is just like I said with uh, the pork and the, the beef and the, the poultry. We were finding it originally back in 90, 1998, 2000 at, at higher levels. But the, then once we implemented the HACCP rule and people started uh, operating under HACCP and using interventions and new technologies and we had new guidelines, our salmonella decreased quite a lot to about 2 to 3 percent. We, we're still finding it. So uh, we discontinued the testing in 2010, just like with beef and poultry, we are developing a new baseline. 
So uh, at randomly uh, selected slaughter plants, we've been going in and testing not just carcasses. We actually moved from carcasses to parts. We found that in the parts, we, we have a higher prevalence. So we're looking at that and coming up with different uh, standards. And like I said, all this goes out for peer review. We had our first phase in May of 2015 to November 2015 with 1,200 samples. Had some uh, interesting results. Uh, we found we were finding, uh, you know, 15 to 20 percent salmonella on our parts, depending on the different types. But we were finding STEX, so shigatoxin producing E. coli on pork, and that was unexpected. So um, this, we decided, all right, let's do phase two. It was expanded. We had over 4,000 samples. In this one, we had a much smaller presence of STEX, and we were more focused on the type of product. We're really focused on ground uh, pork type samples or non-intact samples. And now we're moving into phase three, and we're about to start phase three, which it will just be an ongoing testing for uh, really a non-specified amount of time to see what we're finding. Once we get those data in place, then, uh, then we'll loop back around for new performance standards for pork where we can actually implement those. All right, new products. Um, this isn't necessarily something that comes around uh, often, but we are facing a system within the FSIS and USDA and FDA with some of our new products. Specifically, what I am talking about are food products derived from animal cell cultures. And these are products, meat products, meat or poultry, well, food products that are derived from animal cell culture, cell meat, you, you hear it, lab-based meat, lab-grown meat, that's what I'm referring to whenever I talk about this. On March 7th, uh, I, uh, the FS, uh, Frank Giannis from FDA and I signed a formal agreement to put into place a regulatory structure for these products. It was kind of like, all right, so FSIS, for those of you who don't know, oversee meat, poultry, uh, and eggs, some egg products, and then FDA oversees all other products. And there was some debate over where these products were going to fall. So what's going to happen is FDA will oversee the cell lines where the product is produced. So we'll have cell lines that are maintained, and that, over, that really pulls on their level of expertise. And then once the product starts being produced, the USDA will take over, and then we are working on different entities. We have a working group put together with FDA with actually three different working groups under one umbrella to come up with standards of identity, how it's going to be labeled, and uh, where we're going to go with these products. Now, we're working with our traditional meat stakeholders as well as our companies that make these products uh, that are producing these cell-based uh, food products. There are so many research needs. Uh, I've been asked many times, okay, at what point does the USDA take over? Well, number one, uh, the company, anyone who makes these will have to have a grant of inspection, they will have to have HACCP in place, sanitation, all of those things. But they're not at the point where there's like a plant yet, you know, there's not like a a plant built, you know, they're still on a very small scale. So we don't know what it's going to look like when it's scaled up into a large scale production system. We're working with them and they've promised us, you know, as we get more information, we'll bring you in and help you have oversight. So uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of information that we don't know, like um, uh, from our meat science perspective, what's the amino acid comp composition? Do we have a complete protein? Is it the same as regular meats? What's the functionality if you put this in a meat product? What's the availability if you feed, a, well, if a person eats or if we do our feeding studies on uh, cell-based meats, are they utilized in the same way as uh, a regular meat? So I've asked all these questions. I brought them to the, the people who are making these and, and they're considering them. It's like, we need all this information as we move toward labeling. We do know for sure that there will be transparency and there will be a distinction of these or, and our traditional meat type products. So, and obviously we have research needs on the safety side because we just don't know enough about these products, their shelf life and any risk that might be in place. All right, moving toward the end. 
uh, as I worked with FSIS, I just didn't really, I kind of forgot, I think, that we had a consumer education component until uh, after I really started digging into it. I think I knew that FSIS oversaw this, but until I was being considered for this position, I was like, oh yeah, they, it's both the inspection and then we have our consumer education group. And again, these guys are great. We have both English and Spanish speaking uh, individuals who oversee our meat and poultry hotline, and we have a lot of different programs for consumer education. But what they started learning is that uh, we kind of got the same questions over time. It didn't seem like you know people were necessarily learning a lot. We were still getting crazy questions, which I still want a top 10 list of our crazy questions from the consumer hotline. Um, I, and I, was, I told this story this morning to um, some of our, your leadership, but when I was in Extension in Nebraska, it was a lot of fun because I would be, get these phone calls. And um, there was uh, somebody who called and said, we are going to, we want to have the Guinness Book of World Records for the world's largest hamburger or hamburger patty. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, so they described everything to me, the, the, the fire they were going to cook it on, the size, the dimensions, everything about the hamburger patty. And I was sitting there thinking about it, and I'm like, oh, they're going to ask me how to cook it and make it safe. And the whole time they're describing this, I'm like, they're going to ask me how to take the temperature. And I'm, you know, I'm just in my mind already anticipating what they're going to ask. They get to the end of the conversation, and they said, how do you, do you have any ideas on how we can flip the burger? <laughs> and I was like, what? Uh, well, first of all, no, and second of all, you know, what's the safety? But I think sometimes as scientists, uh, we're thinking about, let's make the food safe, and the consumer's thinking about how to flip the burger, because uh, we're, we're not on the same page. So even though FSIS is not a research entity, we uh, partnered with RTI International and North Carolina State University to, uh, to engage in this five-year research study. So we have uh, different uh, observational studies, focus groups, and different activities that are going on, and we have multiple uh, manuscripts that are going to be coming out of this. I want to highlight some of the things we found. First of all, in hand washing, uh, these people knew we were watching them make, they made turkey burgers and then a salad. They knew we were watching them. 98% did not wash their hands properly, which, I mean, you know, as scientists, you're like, oh my goodness, but, uh, you know, some of them may have attempted to, 30% attempted to in some way, but they didn't use soap or they, you know, didn't dry their hands or they didn't wash their hands long enough. So I think that that is definitely a concern. As a microbiologist, I am an obsessive hand washer. I'm always washing my hands and, you know, I, I don't get sick very often, but I think it's because I wash my hands all the time. That's one of the very basics of you know, public health and staying healthy. On our thermometer use, we gave them thermometers. Now, they didn't know it was a food safety study, so they didn't know what they were being evaluated on, but they did have a food thermometer. Only 30% attempted to use a thermometer, and of those 30%, only half of those cooked it to the proper temperature. The rest undercooked it. So, again, that was a concern. Then we had some issues with cross-contamination. More than 50% of them uh, cross-contaminated their spice containers or salt and pepper shakers. Uh, about 40% contaminated their refrigerator or other places in the kitchen. So the bottom line on all this is even though the FSIS requires a label on, a, you know, the safe food handling label on a package of meat and poultry, the consumers don't notice it, they're not following it, and we're not getting it into uh, the, the behavior changes. So we want a behavior change. So we're doing some things. We have uh, started uh, doing more uh, videos and uh, really targeted activities on, uh, focused around Super Bowl, back to school, uh, different holidays, Thanksgiving, Memorial Day, when people you know, are grilling and doing different things. So more outreach and more of a push. We are trying to partner with some of our uh, TV entities where we might be able to get some PSAs out there, but we are limited on getting the information out. So I've really been challenging our industry partners every time I go to an industry event, uh, asking them, I'm like, know your consumer, know what your consumer's doing with your product, and let's really work on this segment so we can uh, help them to take you know, control of their public health and make sure that their product is safe. And last of all, um, this was uh, something that became very uh, 
a, a passion for me because being in academia, you want to recruit and retain, and we had a shortage of veterinarians, DVM inspectors. And as I got to meeting our, our inspection force, you know, they're very happy and they're, they're great. It's a great place to work. Everyone is uh, uh, really satisfied with their job. It's just like any other entity. And what I, you know, I was like, well, why don't we have more people going into uh, the agency as an inspector? Well, we had no uh, program in place for recruiting from both the, the undergrad level all the way through our, our vet schools. And I was like, oh, why don't we have this in place? And of course, FSIS was already ahead of me. And we have uh, uh, our recruiter in place, Dr. Maria Esteras. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just can't get a good Spanish accent. But anyway, she's in place and she will be uh, coordinating our recruiting activities of inspectors, I gotta advance my slide here. So we will be having, uh, hopefully developing programs in regulatory uh, food safety and different activities for our inspectors to really have the best and the broadest. I was always uh, highly selective in graduate students. I wanted the top of the line. I want the same for the FSIS to have the best and broadest people in FSIS. Most people, a lot of people who go into vet school want to go into small animal medicine, but I think that there is a segment of our students that are really cut out for this type of job as a regulatory inspector, a DV inspector and we're going to start targeting them at the undergrad level and ho and increasing our numbers and really having the best and broadest to oversee food safety so um, thank you so much for listening to me and in our science and our policies uh, the secretary Purdue has the the vision for the department do right and feed everyone in uh, FSIS and the Office of Food Safety. We've added just one word and we say do right and feed everyone safely. Thank you so much for your time and for your attention.